Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the 2020 Australia Day Address. I'm Ricardo Gonsalves, I'm from SBS and it's my pleasure to be your MC for this very special occasion. Firstly, I would like to thank the Conservatorium High Chamber Choir for that moving performance of our beloved uh, Australian Bush anthem, Waltzing Matilda, and I'd also like to credit the choir's conductor, one of Australia's most eminent sopranos and an Australia Day ambassador herself, the incredible Miss Amelia Perugia. So please, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause. Now, I would also like to extend a very warm welcome to the honoured guests joining us here today. Her Excellency, the Honourable Margaret Beasley AM, the Governor of New South Wales, and Mr. Dennis Wilson, the Honourable Gladys Berejiklian, Premier of New South Wales, and Mr. Andrew Parker, Chair of the Australia Day Council of New South Wales and Council Members. We're also delighted to have joining us today Professor Munjed al the 2020 New South Wales Australian of the Year, and sponsors of the Australia Day in New South Wales program, along with many of our inspiring Australia Day ambassadors who will be travelling right across the state on Australia Day and taking part in various local community events. And I'm proud to say once again, I'll be one of them. And it is indeed an honour to have all of you joining us here this afternoon. The Australia Day Council of New South Wales recognises the unique and important position of Aboriginal people in Australian culture and history. And so, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome Yvonne Weldon, the Chair of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, to welcome us to country. Grand, isn't it? To walk up the stairs and walk across the stage. Thank goodness you're not hearing me sing. <laughs> Good afternoon, New South Wales Governor, the Honourable Margaret Beasley, AO, QC, Mr Dennis Wilson, Premier, ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers. We are gathered on the land of Eora. I am the elected chairperson of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, who are the culture authority under the Aboriginal Land Rights Act for the land we're meeting on. I am Radri. I come from Cowra here in New South Wales, from the waters of the Clare, also known as the Lachlan, and of the Murrumbidgee Rivers. I would like to pay my respects to all elders past and present, and to all First Nations and non-First Nations people here today. Welcome to country is an age-old tradition. It is more than just words. It is a spiritual process by honouring the ancestors' footsteps we are all walking in, continuing the practice of many generations before us to the many generations to come. The landscapes of this country tell us the stories of our culture, our history, and our boundaries. The Eora Nation has 29 clans within its boundaries, which is the Hawkes River in the north, the Nepean in the west, and the Georges River in the south. On behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, the elders, and the members, I welcome everyone to the land of the Gadigal. I acknowledge the Gadigal people whose spirits and ancestors will always remain with this land, our Mother Earth. Our practices are sustained throughout the generations and they are ingrained into the core of this country through the hundreds of nations, tribes and clans that have existed here for over 60,000 years. So while we are all gathered here, let us all remember and also acknowledge the many warriors that created pathways for all of us, the ones recognised and the ones we've never heard of. Traditionally, across these lands, 
on these waterways, we traded and we shared for necessity and not for empires. Our sharing and trading brought our people together, creating our sustainability, encouraging our innovation and keeping our ancient practices alive for our future and for everyone's future. Aboriginal people are inclusive of all. We have hundreds of nations from this continent and from across the globe. Whether you come here via foot, air or water, you are welcome. We are all are the colourful, colourful and cultural fabric of this land and that of the world. Our traditions are still practised in these contemporary times, but they are now shared in various forms from the First Peoples and the many that have joined us here. All of us must work together by creating a true healing and a truth telling, bringing about a positive future for everyone. To make that future possible, let us all draw upon my people's spirits as we continue on our journey. May my people's spirits walk with you and guide you as we strive forward for us all. Again, on behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, welcome to Gadigal Land. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Well, today we are here to celebrate the 24th annual Australia Day Address, and this important annual event aims to inspire a national dialogue in the lead up to Australia Day. Each year, since 1997, an influential and inspiring member of our community has been invited to deliver the Australia Day Address. It's a platform for us to hear their stories and unique perspectives on our nation's identity and matters they consider to be of national importance. So over the years, we've heard from many eminent Australians, including former Australians of the Year, Tim Flannery, Professor Michelle Simmons and Ita Buttrose, along with human rights lawyer Denga Dutt, Paralympian Kurt Fernley, and in 2012, uh, psychologist and best-selling author Hugh McKay. One of our speakers, Mr Eddie Wu, joins us here today, and a warm welcome to Eddie. And today, the Australia Day address will be delivered by Mrs Grace Brennan. Now, being a, a television journalist, I know that often the best way to tell a story or an introduction is sometimes with pictures and words. So here's a very short video of what Grace and the Buy from the Bush initiative is all about. I live on farm, my husband's a farmer, and I've kind of watched him suffering through this drought. But more importantly, our kind of broader community um, having a bit of a tough time of it, and I just wanted to do something. I decided to just create a page. It's an Instagram and Facebook page, at Buy From The Bush, and it's basically just a showcase of all the beautiful things you can buy from um, rural communities facing drought at the moment. Buy From The Bush has been an absolute game changer for both myself and the business and the community as a whole. Everything you see in here is sold. I don't have anything that's not sold. Grace doesn't know how much I love her. She doesn't know me and I don't know her and, that, and I know I'd be one of hundreds of people feeling this way about this girl. Angus. Hi Angus. Thank you for all the work. No, no worries. It's exciting to have these 20 bush businesses in Sydney connecting with city customers and having conversations about drought and uh, yeah, it's beautiful. The business has really taken off. Yeah. Um, in the last six weeks the revenue has been incredible. We're feeling the pinch. My brother's a farmer, my dad's a farmer. Little things like this are just, you know, pulling together. It's really going to help the community, I think. We've seen the devastation that's happening. To be able to help them out, it's a privilege to be able to be here and be able to support them in any way we can. I'm really hoping this isn't a flash in the pan Christmas shopping spree. We've got lots of exciting ideas about how to connect um, bush business with city consumers and all sorts of opportunities I think that we can um, springboard off this initial Christmas campaign, but fingers crossed.
Ladies and gentlemen, to officially introduce and welcome our address speaker for 2020, it is now my pleasure to invite the Honourable Gladys Berejiklian, Premier of New South Wales, to the stage. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my absolute pleasure to be here today. Can I start by thanking Yvonne Weldon for the wonderful welcome to country? And also, and also importantly acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we stand and pay our respects to elders past, present and future. Can I acknowledge our wonderful Governor, Her Excellency, the Honourable Margaret Beasley, and Mr Dennis Wilson, to Mr Andrew Parker, the Chair of the Australia Day Council, and take this opportunity to thank him and all his board members for the wonderful work they're undertaking to bring Australia Day to us in 2020. And the very many distinguished Australians here today in the audience and elsewhere uh, about to listen to what I believe will be a truly inspiring address. And it's a pleasure every year to be able to welcome the guest speakers, but in particular, uh, this year of all years, uh, I think it's an understatement to say that it's been a really challenging period of time for New South Wales, for our com regional communities across the state. Of course, we're currently grappling with the huge impact of the devastating bushfires and working to assist all of our impacted communities. And many of these communities, unfortunately, were already experiencing the devastations experienced by the drought. And while it's a difficult time, there's been an overwhelming spirit of compassion and generosity which has sustained and is sustaining so many. We've seen this in the work of our volunteers, whether it's um, emergency services volunteers or people opening their homes to neighbours um, or even people act having their homes as makeshift animal shelters. And of course, um, the millions of dollars that have been raised through bushfire appeals is also a symbol of this community spirit. And again, uh, Australians have demonstrated our ability to rise to the occasion when circumstances demand. And in that context, I don't believe there could be a better speaker this year than Grace Brennan. The Australia Day Address uh, in New South Wales provides insights into our national identity through the eyes of distinguished members of the community. Sometimes ordinary Australians doing extraordinary, extraordinary things and lifting all of us to think about how we can do our best. And as Ricardo stated so eloquently since 1997, we've had many distinguished people give us their insights and their journey and uh, offer us their hope and inspiration for the future. And today, uh, as has been indicated, Grace Brennan, who's the founder of Buy From The Bush, will talk to us about the importance of community-driven change and the impact she's had. And given the impact of the drought and also of bushfires on so many of our regional communities, Grace's message and the work she does is both timely and more critical than ever. Having grown up in Sydney, Grace moved to Warren 10 years ago where she lives on a sheep and, and, and cattle farm as we've seen with her husband and three children. And she's worked extensively in community development and youth engagement and more recently co-founded co an online agriculture employment platform called AgDraft. She could have talked about that alone today as well. But Buy From The Bush is the product of this experience. It combines her expertise mobilising rural communities with the business and technology skills she's developed at AgDraft. Seeing the impact of three years of drought on her farm and local community really inspired Grace to do something about it. And in just three short months, she's become the face of regional entrepreneurism, but more importantly, the face of hope. What started as a hashtag on the 16th of October last year has become a movement with hundreds of thousands of followers on all social media platforms, and in fact, I understand, has its own theme song. And almost every item featured on these social media sites is completely sold out. Rural retailers have reported doubling their annual income in two weeks alone. Shops that were on the brink of collapse or closure have been spared. And of course, with partners like PayPal and Visa and others, um, the Stay in the Bush campaign is gaining momentum in so many different ways. And no doubt there are obvious economic benefits to people in the bush from this initiative. But I believe it's the intangible benefits, perhaps, that are the most impactful. And in my personal visits to communities ravaged by drought and now fire, I've encouraged or, or actually encountered, I should say, strong, resilient people facing difficult times uh, and difficult situations when, which can seem insurmountable. And if there is one message we can all convey to them is that they are not alone. You are not alone. 
That's why Buy From The Bush is such a powerful platform. It connects city and bush and gives purpose to both. It empowers rural communities and highlights the diversity of our regional economies and everything they have to offer. And it builds hope and morale in very challenging circumstances. It's important that Buy From The Bush continues to grow as our regional communities recover from fire while continuing to face down the challenges of the drought. So I'm so delighted Grace accepted uh, the opportunity, this platform to talk about her journey and the way forward. She's such an amazing Australian, making a difference and demonstrating that any of us can be the drivers of positive change. Grace, we're so looking forward to hear you speak and can I please invite you to the stage. Your Excellency, the Honourable Margaret Beasley, AO, QC, Governor of New South Wales. The Honourable Gladys Berejiklian, Premier of New South Wales. Chair and Council Members of the Australian Council, Australia Day Council of New South Wales. Distinguished guests, ladies, gentlemen, and everyone who travelled from Warren. <laughs> I'm honoured to be speaking to you today. Honoured because as a self-employed mum living on a farm in Western New South Wales, I get to contribute to a national conversation I've often felt quite remote from. Our community of Warren is a long way from anywhere. And as most mothers of small children will relate to, the kitchen table can often feel a long way from the boardroom table. It's easy to feel like all the important things, the things that really matter, happen elsewhere, out there somewhere. Yet last year, at my kitchen table in Warren, I created an Instagram account called Buy From The Bush, and I'm very proud to say it's had a real impact. One of the first requests that came through after I accepted the invitation to talk today was a request for a brief bio. Now, among the distinguished guests in the audience, I imagine a brief bio comes pretty naturally. You could easily just add a paragraph or two to an email without much thought or trepidation. But for me, it inevitably results in a pause, then a sigh, short reflection about what on earth I've been doing with my life, <laughs> and a desire to write something like Grace Brennan, still finding her feet. <laughs> I wonder across the country how many women working part-time or running small businesses, coordinating childcare schedules and managing household budgets, volunteering in school canteens, organising fundraisers, being unofficial carers, good friends, loyal partners, might also pause at a request for a bio. How to find the inspiring in the ordinary? How to find the value in unpaid work? How to find the credentials in a lifetime of career decisions based more around sacrifices than aspirations. For me, the deviation from lofty career ambition started with an egg hurtling towards me in the dark on Halloween when I was 14. And after a lifetime of backyard cricket, I took a catch with a soft follow through that my dad had taught me would take the sting out of a fast moving cricket ball. And miraculously, I landed it, then threw it back into the darkness, only to hear an expletive seconds later as Jack copped an, e an egg to the elbow. It was enough to fall in love at 14. What I didn't realise at the time that I was, is that I was falling in love with a farmer. At 14, Jack already knew he was destined for a life on the land. Like so many others who grow up the children of farmers, it was in his blood. Even at that age, it was clear to me when we visited the farm that he was his happiest and most alive in the sweet dry air of the Western Plains of New South Wales. Fortunately, I loved the bush and I knew it quite well. 
I'd read Banjo Patterson. I'd listened to Slim Dusty. Watched The Man from Snowy River. I mean, what else was there to know? After all, the country, the country life was a simple life, a healthy, balanced life. Within weeks of starting my new life in the bush, these simple preconceptions were challenged in every way. We experienced consecutive floods, rising debt levels, the impacts of severe mental illness and intense family stress. I learned about physical isolation, loneliness and exhaustion. I witnessed hard work under extreme conditions. Through the lens of a city girl's eye, I saw mateship, love, devotion and resilience like I'd never seen it before. Living in a rural community presented a much bigger culture shock than I'd anticipated. I had to let go of the anonymity that I'd enjoyed in Sydney. There was no ducking into a supermarket, head down on a mission. In the bush, the mission is interrupted by questions, connections, invitations. I had to accept that we could be in the biggest rush in the world, take for example being lab in labour and living a couple of hours from the local hospital, but if we ran into a neighbour on the road, we would stop and chat. We'd chew the fat about the weather, a crop, a good yarn. It's important, Jack would say. We can't be rude. I learned that when you live in the bush and something goes wrong, you fix it yourself. If you don't know how, you get on the phone to a neighbour. You work it out. Through trial and error and inconvenience. But then, you know for next time. This self-reliance empowers rural communities to solve their own problems. No doubt, this same self-reliance was the very essence of local indigenous communities long before the white fella went inland. When the early explorers did come, I can only imagine the ingenuity and determination it took to carve a life in the bush. Qualities built upon by veterans returning from war and being awarded soldier settlements. Immigrant hawkers crossing the mountains and walking miles to sell their wares. Gold miners and others. Country towns have been built on what I would call a foundation of doers. On any given day, an Australian farmer is an amateur scientist, vet, builder or mechanic. They often manage multi-million dollar assets. They might trade commodities before lunch and then genetically test their sheep flock after lunch. Our local bus driver, a mother of three, is also an aged care worker and a firefighter. Farmers' wives might, go, might do a feed run in the morning, feeding stock, and then go to work as researchers, fashion designers, online business owners or lawyers. Yet so often, when we talk about the bush, the rhetoric is focused on a battler. I've searched for this Aussie bush battler, and I can tell you I haven't found her yet. As Australians, we need to start telling a different story about the bush and about drought. Images of emaciated sheep, dry dams, defeated men, Poor buggers. They sit nicely in a media reel of the year that was. But is that the story of drought? In my community, drought crept in. Great seasons turned to lean ones. Prepared farmers started to feed out stored grain. Profits turned to losses. Contractors lose their contracts. Farm employees get laid off. People stop going to town quite so much. Shopping lists contract. School fundraisers are cancelled because people aren't buying tickets. Women return to work from maternity leave early because their husbands are out of work. It's easier to get into a haircut because the local hairdresser says things have been pretty slow. The odd farm gets put on the market 
young couples move away. The new cafe that was going to open gets put on hold for a while till things pick up. The boutique owner lets her casual staff go and works longer hours. She doesn't go to the trade fair to buy new wares. We get together and talk about dust because it's easier than talking about depression. Banks keep calling about machinery loans, about overdrafts. Local businesses with credit outstanding start to call their clients, their friends and neighbours, asking for debt to be repaid. Men start to wander in search of work. They travel thousands of kilometres to work on machinery, to acquire new clients, to earn a wage. Women work harder, roles shift, supplementary income becomes the only income. And always there is innovation, efficiencies, savings, learning. But there is great suffering too. The lack of control and uncertainty brings fear and tension. The pride gained from solving a problem and getting the job done can no longer be relied upon. Debt hangs low like a heavy cloud over the kitchen table. When asked recently what one image summed up the drought for me, it is a woman at her kitchen table in tears. Fear of loss, fear of isolation, fear of suicide, and stress. Lots and lots of stress. So drought is the dry creek bread, the poor sheep. But there's more to tell, so much more. One day in October of last year, I listened to an interview with the Prime Minister. The journalist was pressing the Prime Minister on his drought relief efforts and stressing the exceptional nature of the current drought and the urgency with which a response was required. The Prime Minister led with statements about various funding packages. Dollar figures equating to action. As it got heated, more packages were cited. Something inside me was activated. I so appreciated the journalist's tenacity and recognition of the urgency of a great national disaster. I understood the Prime Minister's line of defence. They were doing something. Just look at the numbers. But they were missing something, something critical. This conversation wasn't communicating why all Australians should care about this drought. The fact that if in this exceptional and relentless drought, farming businesses fold en masse, so too might our rural communities. And what an enormous loss that would be for Australia. I believe rural communities are a treasure worth protecting, not for their contribution to GDP, but something much more valuable, their contribution to Australian identity and the Australian story. In my mind, the bush narrative needs an update and the story of drought needs to be captured in a different way, one that engages community and allows them to feel connected to the bush not out of pity, out of pride, curiosity and desire. So in October last year, Buy From The Bush was born. Perhaps to many, a social media account seems an unlikely response to a great national disaster. But I had a background in community development and had seen the power of community-driven change. More recently, while working in a startup, I'd learned to define the problem the need, and develop a solution, the product. I'd long been obsessed with the beautiful boutiques in communities like Walgett, Canamble, Warren, Trangy, Narramine. Stylish and enterprising locals, cleverly curating collections of fashion, gifts and homewares that allowed the bush women to feel a little less out of the loop. I had friends creating innovative online platforms, painting artwork, designing jewellery. Their businesses were unique and incredibly worthy, yet they were limited. 
reliant on cash flow from farming communities that weren't spending. There was a very clear need. The need to attract cash flow to declining communities. The need to create work, to inject dollars and also hope. To allow people to feel visible and valued. The need for both symbolic and real support from the city to the bush. Social media provided the solution. It is, after all, a storytelling mechanism, a connector, and a great enabler. It allows a direct path between consumer and supplier. And importantly, it invites a simple action. See it, like it, buy it. Very quickly, the Buy From The Bush campaign took flight. In the first six weeks, $2.6 million of revenue was generated from bus for businesses featured on our social pages. In that period, 25 jobs were created in rural communities facing drought because of increased sales. More than $320,000 was spent at local Australia Post franchises benefiting, benefiting small business in small, in small towns. Businesses reported an average revenue increase of 660% on the same period last year and an average increase in visits to their websites of over 1,000%. All of this was achieved before we even reached the busy Christmas period of December. We then launched our website and had 54,000 unique visitors in the first eight days. Buy from the Bush was the highest ranking search term in New South Wales and the second highest ranking nationally. Australia Post reported a 40% increase in parcel postage in regional areas. Beyond the 240 businesses featured on our page, the Buy From The Bush hashtag has had a broader impact. All businesses need to do is add a hashtag to their social media posts and immediately they connect with consumers wanting to support Bush business. To date, the hashtag has been used 63,000 times. Currently, there are over 400,000 people following our campaign on social media. That's 400,000 potential customers buying in to Bush business. And that is important. Buy from the Bush is less about crisis relief and more about sustainable support for rural communities in the long term. It's not about charity, it's about investment. At Christmas time, proud gift givers gushed over gorgeous baskets they'd found in Bogan Gate handmade cricket bats from Gyra, a children's book from Outback South Australia, a ham straight from the farm in Barham, or rugs designed by Central Desert artists and sold in a gallery in Moree. Beautiful, impressive things from the Aussie bush found their way to Christmas trees in Melbourne, Perth, London, New York, and across Australia. This was not about pity, it was about joy, the joy of giving beautiful things with a precious story of origin. To really achieve long-term impact, this Bush brand needs to be developed, marketed and celebrated within the context of a global trend towards meaningful consumption. And I'm not talking about retail. There's a wealth of services and remote skill sets to be tapped into in the Bush also. As a fashion designer in Burrowa put it, our community won't survive on charity. It'll survive on good business. Yet, the goodwill that's been shown to rural communities throughout the campaign is worth celebrating. We recently held a pop-up market in Martin Place, as you saw. A, stall <coughs> a stallholder from Hay, New South Wales, jumped in an Uber to make his way to town. When the driver asked him what he, he was in town for and he told him he was there as part of the buy from the bush market, the driver stopped the meter and said, this one's on me. A nursery owner from Dubbo recently got a call from a Melbourne supplier who'd followed by from the bush and realised what the drought was doing to small business. They asked, what can we do to help? And then sent free stock for her to sell in her shop. The connection between strangers has been striking, both for its sentiment and its substance. Handwritten notes of gratitude accompanied parcels, while phone orders often ended in tears and laughter. The tyranny of distance was overcome. 
I heard from a wife of a harvest contractor whose annual income had been one quarter of their usual income owing to the drought. On day two of a very limited harvest season, their harvester caught fire and was destroyed. In the midst of this, she launched a fashion line, was featured on our page and sold out within a matter of days. Minutes after being featured, she stood, crying at her kitchen bench, relief and gratitude overwhelming her. It was enough to keep the mortgage paid, the lights on, food on the table and water in the tank. A boutique owner wrote, you've saved my business. I was on the verge of closing my doors, but can now keep going. I asked if she would mind if I shared that with the, our followers. Please don't, she said. I don't want my family knowing I was on the brink of closure. An artist who'd never had the confidence to hustle for her art before was inundated with commissions, including a corporate Christmas card order sent to clients across the globe. The benefits have flowed on to local communities. Summarised best by Jill Kelly, a local area vet in Canamble, New South Wales. In her day job, Jill works on the front line of the drought. She carries out autopsies in dust storms and fields calls from farmers at their wits end. In her spare time, she paints watercolour paintings and Christmas cards. After being featured on Buy From The Bush, Jill sent me a message. Yesterday, I processed 66 sales in a day. Normally, I wouldn't make 66 online sales in a year. I sold $2,000 worth of greeting cards in a day. And although I'm exhausted, I'm over the moon. This morning, I spent $160 at the post office. I bought myself breakfast because I felt so rich. And with the orders still rolling in, I've decided to hire the local painter to paint my spare room, a job I've been putting off for ages, and take the local window covering business up on their quote for new blinds in my house. Thanks from me, the post office, the cafe, the painter, the blind business, and all our town. At a time when much is made of the divide between city and country, between left and right, between big business and small business, the strength of a united community, albeit an online community, has achieved real change. It's opened conversations, lifted spirits, created jobs, and undoubtedly saved businesses. The devastation seen by fires over the last few months has been unsettling for Australians. It's felt almost too much to bear. Yet bear it, we have. Firefighters, volunteers, businesses, communities, and our elected representatives. We've witnessed tremendous fear, loss, inspiring courage, and great generosity. However, there's also been a noisy community outrage. The same social media channels that carried such useful positivity through the Buy From The Bush campaign have seemed heavy with angst, resentment, and anger. In many instances, the outrage is fueled by genuine concern and disappointment. People feel they've been ignored and now vindicated in the worst possible way. In less than subtle language, they say, we told you so. They draw a firm line between them and us. They lay blame. But I think blame tends to isolate. It does not empower. To me, it's not what the Australian spirit calls us to do. The very foundation of Australian identity so present in the bush is about doing. It's about helping, solving problems. It's a modest, practical kindness, getting stuck in. In the wake of the fires, people shared stories of the extraordinary bravery of firefighters, of home-cooked meals being offered to stranded evacuees, of neighbours saving neighbours, of shop owners opening their stores in the wake of enormous personal loss to ensure that others had what they need. The theme for this address is everyone, every story. As Australians, when faced with great fear about our future, 
and a desire for positive change, I would urge us to think about the story we tell because a good story has great power. Let's tell a truthful one, one that acknowledges our flaws but in equal measures celebrates our enormous successes. A story that's not shaped by our divisions but instead weaves narrative all the more interesting for our differences. A story that inspires progress, not perfection. The story of Buy from the Bush and the incredible community response to our bushfires depicts an Australia where the city and the bush feel connected as one community. We're a country of people who want to help each other. What a triumph that is. That ordinary people with pretty ordinary bios can have extraordinary impact and even greater triumph. These are the very foundations of our society. Buy from the Bush shows that they're not just Australian ideals, but Australian reality. That is the story it tells. It's up to all of us Australians to continue our story, to actively listen, to allow for dramatic pause, for disagreement, to tell a story that's more, that talks more about us and less about them. A story that honours the grit of the bush and the flair of the city. Let's each of us, all of us, tell a good yarn. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. I think as you can tell by the response, it, it really struck a chord and to um, have the story told, it really does open everyone's eyes. Um, thank you so much for your powerful words today. If I could just uh, ask you just to stay there just for a couple more seconds, I'd like to invite onto the stage uh, Mr Andrew Parker, the Chair of the Australia Day Council of New South Wales, to present the vote, vote of thanks. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, Your Excellency, the Governor, uh, the Premier, thank you so much for your remarks and Yvonne for your uh, gracious welcome to country. Uh, as Ricardo said, I, uh, I'm the Chair, uh, my great fortune to be the Chair of the Australia Day Council of New South Wales. Uh, and I have the easy job today to thank uh, such an extraordinary speaker. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I thought that was an inspiring, highly personal, uh, and life-affirming uh, in, in a speech from Grace Brennan this afternoon. We all love a good yarn, uh, but I think it's safe to say that your address, Grace, was so much more. Um, as Grace mentioned, the theme of Australia Day 2020 is everyone, every story. And as the Premier said uh, in her welcome, I think Grace's story emphatically reminds us that everyday Australians like Grace, like you and I, can make a real difference to our community. And what a privilege it has been for all of us to learn more about you, Grace, the driving force behind Buy From The Bush, an initiative that has excelled in both sentiment and substance and brought about transformative change for so many that we just heard. I think Grace was not a frustrated keyboard warrior complaining, but someone inspired to act, prepared to fail, to fix a problem, and to do it creatively with passion. Your humility, a key word, 
is partnered with shrewd acumen, and no doubt this is just the beginning of the buy from the bush campaign and effort. In fact, I predict your 200,000 Instagram followers will hit 300 by the end of the month. So as we reflect on the success of Buy from the Bush, uh, even in its early incarnation, I think you have inspired us to think bigger about the strength of a connected and empowered community where victory is a shared story. And this, as you said, Grace, is Australia at its very best. So thank you, Grace, for delivering the 24th annual Australia Day address. And on behalf of the New South Wales Government and the Australia Day Council of New South Wales, please accept a small gift. Uh, today's address has been broadcast to a wider audience, which is fantastic, uh, both Sky News Extra and ABC Radio National. A full transcript of Grace's address will be available on australiaday.com.au from 3 o'clock this afternoon. And you can listen to the address again, as I know many people in this room will, in full at 10 o'clock on Australia Day, the 26th, uh, 10 o'clock a.m., courtesy of ABC Radio National or on Monday the 27th of January at 11.30 a.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Time. The Australia Day in Sydney program of events is supported by a dedicated network of organisations committed to fostering the Australian spirit, and I'm delighted that many of their representatives from these organisations could join us today. Thank you to all our program sponsors. I would also, as Ricardo said, like to extend a very special thank you to the Sydney Conservatorium of Music for its support and for the use of this wonderful venue again. On Sunday, the Australia Day 2020 program will see many events take place right across New South Wales, providing a much needed opportunity for communities to come together and acknowledge the remarkable and resilient Australian spirit and to honour and support those facing extraordinary hardship that Grace spoke so eloquently about. And there are many ways to participate in Australia Day and we encourage everyone to mark the day in a way that is right for them. You can create your own story with friends and family by attending events in your local community or your own backyard. In Sydney, as the sun rises on the 26th of January, the Woogalora Indigenous Morning Ceremony will take place at the Barangaroo Reserve, featuring a smoking ceremony, special dance performances, and the singing of the national anthem in the local Aboriginal language, Eora, and English. And I can't recommend Woogalora more to all of you. Throughout the day, in Sydney, the iconic locations of Sydney Harbour, the Rocks, Darling Harbour and Bradfield Park will host an array of events, including the legendary Harbour Parade and Ferrython, a 21-gun salute to Australia, the Oz 10K wheelchair race and the summer playground. And the evening will culminate, as always, with the unforgettable Australia Day live concert featuring a stellar lineup of Australian performers, John Williamson, Vanessa Amorosi, Christine Arnu and Eskimo Joe, among the legendary performers. Australia Day Live will, we believe, create an atmosphere of both optimism and unity. And importantly, we'll be paying tribute to those affected by the bushfires and drought and share our appreciation for the extraordinary efforts of our firefighters. The concert is broadcast across the nation on ABC TV from 7.30 p.m. And throughout the day and during the concert, we will be encouraging Australians to donate to some of the amazing charities working to support the bushfire and drought-affected communities. 
So I encourage everyone to visit australiaday.com.au and your local council websites to see how you can take part in this Australia Day and support your community. Australia Day is, after all, for everyone. Thank you all very much again, and we appreciate you coming to grace this quite magnificent address. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Ladies and gentlemen, we will conclude our event this afternoon with the Australian National Anthem. So would you please stand as we welcome the Conservatorium High Chamber Choir to the stage to lead us in Advance Australia Fair. Thank you, everyone. Thank you once again, uh, once again to the Conservatorium High Chamber Choir. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this officially concludes the 2020 Australia Day Address. I would now like to invite you to join us at reception at the atrium located downstairs. Thank you once again to our speaker, Grace Brennan. Thank you that very much. It was quite inspiring. I'll make sure we get, get a mention on Small Business Secrets on SBS. I'm sure there's a lot of stories there. And thank you very much to everyone here. I'm Ricardo Gonzalez. I wish you all a very happy Australia Day. Thank you. <laughs>